Hi everyone. Um, so yes, my name is Natasha Saisalem, and I am one of the heads of technology at a, a really weirdly unknown company called Sky. Um, some people might know me by my maiden name, Natasha Zellum. I got married to a lovely guy called Mr. Sace. And then, yeah, very nice guy. Um, and um, yeah, I was really, really determined to keep my surname. So double-barreled, it would have been Natasha Zellum's ace, which kind of, in my head, sounded like Natasha Zellum's ace, which is, of course, true. Um, but I couldn't go through the rest of my life being known as Natasha Zellum's ace. Uh, so that went out the window, and then I went with Natasha Say Salem. So yeah, I work at Sky. I've been at Sky for five months. Um, these are some of the great things that are delivered from Sky and Leeds. Everything from Sky News Online to Sky Sports, Sky Shop, which is one of the things that I look after, um, and Sky Online Service. But like I say, I've only been there for a couple of months, so I kind of thought I'd talk a little bit about my background, which kind of goes into my slides. So I've worked in digital for a very, very long time, but I kind of made my name working on a lot of fixed deadline websites for broadcasters. So things like the very glamorous I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here, uh, Britain's Next Top Model, Dancing on Ice. Yeah. <laughs> Thrilling stuff. Um, so yeah, they were fixed deadline, um, usually fixed requirement as well, working in an agile methodology, also delivered from the fine city of Leeds. Um, and then I went over to the BBC, um, commuting every day to Salford, which was lots of fun. Um, and I did the BBC Sport refresh. So that was turning this beautiful site here uh, with a lovely left-hand navigation, we were kind of nested within news, so we had some burgundy there, which was kind of news as colours. Obviously still sport yellow, quite cluttered, as you can see. Um, and it was the first refresh of the website in, I think, just over nine years. So we turned the site from this to this, uh, which you will hopefully agree with me and say it was a much more, you know, it's a big improvement. I technically have to say, obviously Sky Sports is better. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, yeah, no, I was very, very proud of that. Um, this is a bit of an example of how hard it was to get the site live. So it took us just over three months from being code complete to get the site live. And a key thing on that was kind of just the amount of resilience that we needed to do at the BBC to get things like this live. So from you know, final user testing sessions, final load testing sessions, we were running two versions of the site, so the old site and the new site, so kind of populating two sites at any given time. And then we launched on transfer deadline day, so kind of one of our highest peak traffic days. Uh, no pressure. So we got BBC Refresh out of the way, and then um, we got the Olympics out of the way. Um, and then this really clever guy I used to work with called Matthew was kind of looking at the way we did live events. So we'd done the Olympics, massive, massive live event and what the BBC are very, very good at doing. And then we kind of looked at the way that news were doing events and the way that Glastonbury were doing events. And the key thing is they were doing their own live event propositions, but they were all different and it kind of seemed nonsensical. So we kind of started to look at, you know, the commonalities between those live events. And to be honest, there was loads. You know, they had a video player, they had text, you know, they had tables of data. Okay, for sport, it might be fixtures and results. For news, it might be voting results. For music, it might be a set list, but it's just a table with some data. And that's where BBC Live came from. We kind of realized there was kind of no sense of everyone building their own live event solutions. Why don't we build a vanilla white label solution that the BBC can use across the board? And that's what we did. So this is an example of it for Sochi, which was kind of our first big launch. Uh, so it took us, I think, just under a year to get the MVP out. And this is kind of one of our proudest moments when I was at the B. So this was what we coined a Super Saturday. So this is BBC Live being used on the Super Saturday, five different instances on the same day. So you have Wimbledon, you have the World Cup, you have the uh, World War I centenary, 
uh, lovely Glastonbury and that Queen's Baton Relay where loads of lovely people run with a stick on fire. Um, all, <laughs> all responsive, one service product, brilliant. So my talk is about, I guess, what I call surviving a few beasts. These fixed deadline projects, fixed requirement projects, um, usually large MVPs. And so I think of myself as a little bit of an artist. So I was kind of thinking about how I would describe what I've kind of gone through. And this was my best kind of interpretation of it. <laughs> so to kick things off, I guess my first tip for you guys kind of working on these things is really think about who your stakeholders they're the people who should be your main people that you're speaking to about the project. But who are they? What are their goals? What are their needs? How do you need to communicate to them? And the key thing about stakeholders is they are completely invested in your project and you need to identify them and you need to get their input and they need to, be, and they need to feel valued. Because the key thing is if you don't do that, one of them will come out and they will scare you and they will trip up your project. And then you're working to a fixed deadline and you can't afford for these things to happen. So my biggest piece of advice for this sort of stuff is right at the start of a project, get your key team in, get a load of post-it notes, and draw this out on a board, and then look at a power and interest grid. So just write as many names as you can think of, and then start to place them into these boxes. So starting at the bottom left, power and in low power, low interest, it's probably somebody who gives you your analytics code, something which you won't ever have to customize. You just take it out of the box, you plug it onto your site. They've got low power, low interest. You just need to monitor them. Um, low interest, high power, keep satisfied. They're your MDs or your director generals. They've got a lot of power, but they're busy people. They just kind of need to know what's going on broadly. They've got a lot of power, uh, sorry, they've got low power, high interest. You need to keep them informed, you need to manage them. Make sure they don't derail your project, but keep them satisfied. And then the danger zone, the top right hand corner, high power, high interest. And that's the box you don't want to mess up. I think it's also really worth mentioning on this. It's good to revisit this kind of halfway through the project as well to see where the names are and see if it actually matches true. Because some people may change based on your requirements. If you're working in an agile, iterative way, you know, when your requirements change, your stakeholders will change. So sometimes it's really, really good to revisit this. But what I would suggest with this is kind of look at these four boxes and when you've grouped these four sets of teams together, think about how you're going to communicate to them. Think how you're gonna keep them involved, how you're gonna understand their needs. Um, and I, it's been incredibly useful for me. So, I have prizes. I'm like into my pop references. So, does anybody know the name of this character from Buffy? Go inside. Spike, All right, the lady over there, can you pass these <gasps> sweets? All right, I might bludgeon someone. <laughs> Rupert Murdoch won't be very happy with me. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> okay, so spiking. So, if you've not done any hypothesis up front before starting a project, you're starting it really blindly. You know, what design technologies, infrastructure are you going to use? Are they future proof? Can they scale to what you need? And that's the key thing about spiking is before you kind of start a main project, really spike out some of the key risk areas. Because the earlier you do it at the, pro at the start of the project, the cheaper it is. And kind of, you know, not using a Facebook thing, but, you know, fail fast. You know, there's nothing worse than kind of going halfway into a project and realizing that your existing infrastructure can't support what you're trying to build. You know, these are the kind of questions that I kind of speak to my teams about. You know, what is our goal? Defining the problem and who our customer is. What do we want to learn? What's the minimum we can build to test that? And how do we measure success? So kind of using the BBC Live analogy, just because it's kind of in my head, 
Our goal was to build a platform for live events that could be easily tailored to suit a wide range of events, which we can continually iterate and improve over time. The problem was that the underlying technology had to be scalable across the BBC. You know, we think about it, news, sport, music, using it. On that Super Saturday, just think about the number of traffic that was hitting that whole area. And as I kind of alluded to, speed, load was a key consideration with live events, as we'd need to update the page more frequently. So, you know, kind of skipping to what we did, for BBC Live, we used uh, Socket.io and Socket.js using Node to see how quickly we could achieve horizontal scaling to end users for the back end. And on the front end, uh, we needed a stable, scalable, future-proof framework that would enable users to create interactionable components. So bear in mind, this is 2013, right? So we spiked using Backbone, Ember, and Angular. And in the end, we used Angular. Ember was too new, and the API kept changing, even whilst we were spiking with it. But when I was putting these slides together, it was really interesting, because I was thinking, you know, now in 2015, would we have made the same decisions? I don't know. But it kind of is kind of a poignant point about how technology moves and changes. OK, prize number two. Da! Catch. Ace. God, prepared. I kept gun shot. Um, so, yeah, this one is about comms. So, it is like single handedly the thing that fails projects, man. You know, is comms. If you think back to the BBC Live analogy, we had so many stakeholders. You know, we had people from news, we had people from music, we had, you know, sports stakeholders. You know, there was just so many people interested in what we needed to do. And so that power and influence and managing people, but also communicating to them. And I think, kind of in my career, I think my biggest tips on this stuff are, number one, when you're looking at those groups, work out how people want to be communicated to whether it's reports, whether it's face-to-face, -face, whether it's, I don't know, Slack, you know, but people take in information in different ways. Sending people reports who are never going to read them is just kind of soul-destroying if you've had to spend time putting them together. But likewise, it's soul-destroying when you have face-to-face -face meetings or telephone conferences and people don't turn up. So you work with your stakeholders, establish how they want to communicate with you because, you know, they have to keep in touch. That's what fails projects. Show and tells, road shows of progress. I think those are the key things. Really think out. Speak to other teams who've delivered those sort of big projects. See what worked, what didn't work. I know it's really boring, but it is like genuinely the key thing around that. And on that note, I think when you're kind of talking about comms, <sighs> I think in my experience, when you're kind of setting out a project to people, it's a hearts and minds piece. Tell them a story. Tell them what user need you're fulfilling. Tell them what you're fixing, what problem you're solving. And that is the key thing. Do it with prototypes. Let people see what you're proposing to build. Don't give them Word documents. Give them rough and ready, low, medium fatality prototypes, really quick and dirty things, just to show them what you're trying to build. What is the user need we're trying to solve? You know, what is the audience story? What could that look like? You know, it's one of the things, you know, not to name drop, which we're doing at Sky. Um, but yeah, you know, we are obviously, you know, expanding in Sky. And it is, it's key, we need to kind of explain why we're doing it and explain, you know, where we're doing it. So, you know, as you've probably read in the press, we are building a brand new complex in Leeds at Leeds Dock. This are uh, some renders of what the new building is going to look like. So this is what it's going to look like. And as of today, that's what that space looks like right now. Should have got some Polish builders in. Um, but um, no, it's looking great. So this is some of the renders of, um, I think, building two, if I remember rightly. Um, as you can see, we've hired some really lovely hipster models for these photos. Um, but I, I think, kind of all seriousness, 
it is a pretty much a once in a lifetime opportunity to build a building which will fulfill the needs of our business and also fulfill the way we want to work. You know, collaboration is at the heart of what we want to do. And, you know, from my previous place where we built this beautiful um, open, you know, office environment, which was great, don't get me wrong, but we didn't have any walls. And when the way that we want to work, we want walls to stick stuff on. Um, and it, yeah, that was kind of a bit of a fail. So what was brilliant is the architects that are building our new offices spent loads of time in our current offices watching us work, watching how we had to kind of, you know, rudimentarily found ways of working to, you know, satisfy a collaboration. Um, and they've kind of devised the building around that. So there's lots of collaborative spaces. There's lots of areas where we can have ad hoc meetings. So that phrase, well, we can't have that because we don't, you know, there isn't a meeting room available, just doesn't exist. It shouldn't exist. So, you know, from, sorry, from day one, the fabric of the building is going to be there to kind of suit the needs of, you know, the working way that we want to go. Delivery. So, I'm a massive believer in this, visibility of progress, and showing that you care about your stakeholders' goals. You know, I think it's promote your work through friendly openness. This was at my last place, printed off in like the biggest sort of Liberace ghetto fabulousness on the wall. And it had everything. It had kind of along the top, the sprints, and all of the teams worked in the same sprint cycles. It had, because we were in sports, key events. And any events in yellow were the ones that scared me. So I kind of could spot them and be a little bit intimidated by them. Um, you know, kind of our development goals. And then kind of what all the teams were working on. If you're interested, the grey is third party, red is ideation, and green is development. And it's never that smooth. So the red and the green would kind of blend and it would be kind of brown in the middle. But I guess my point is on this is, allow yourself enough time for ideation. And this isn't just UX. You know, this is UX, working with business analysts, working with our developers, working with product, working with tech, to have discussions. What are we building? What is the user need? Why are we building it? Do we need to spike anything? What technology are we going to use? And to give us those time to ask those questions, to look at kind of prototyping it, dismiss it if we didn't think it was a good idea, but to give us that time so that once we'd kind of done that ideation, we'd kind of blend into development, and then the work would move smoothly. But I guess my point is, yeah, make sure you kind of, if you're afraid to put this on a wall, if you're afraid to kind of commit to stakeholders roughly when you're going to deliver the work, I guess I should ask why. Ah. <laughs> I was told my, my, my deck wasn't sky enough, so, uh, so there we go. Uh, beware of the scope creep. Um, the three words that strike fear in me are MVP. So, if anyone doesn't know what MVP is, minimum viable product, maximum valuable product, I've heard many, many incarcerations of it. Um, but, yeah, it's misused and, you know, be really, really careful with it. You know, it, Agile is about incremental delivery. The MVP is a set of features the minimum set of features to test out your hypothesis. You know, this is the core set that you need to go live. As a delivery person, I'd say you should always challenge the MVP and make sure that you're at the back of your mind, that whole you ain't going to need it yet mentality is always there. I think my biggest experience on this is if you're constantly open about your delivery, and you're hitting your targets and you're demonstrating to your stakeholders and communicating really beautifully and efficiently that you're delivering things, that kind of sets people's mind at rest. Because I think people, you know, especially in product, are kind of used to that thing of, oh, it's going to be delivered in V1.5 or it's going to be delivered in the next, you know, large iteration or whatever. And they've experienced that that might not have happened. You know, so I think a lot of what I do is kind of setting 
expectations up front and gaining people's trust and showing demonstrably that they'll get when they, you know, the deliverables when they, we say that they're going to get them there. Um, and so you've got to be really, really strict about the MVP. It's one small step, but it's not the only step you're going to take. Ho, ho, ho. Um, so, yeah, I, that's my bit of a warning on MVPs. And I think there's a really good lesson, I think, on MVP as well, is really think about the leanest way to get the product live. I remember when we were working on the Olympics, I think we were launching the, the Olympics site, I think three weeks before the Olympics was going live. And uh, we had problems with the data for the medals table. Just could not get this medals table data to behave itself. And um, it just took one of us to kind of, you know, scratch our heads and go, why are we delaying getting this likely for the medals table when the medals table is not going to change for three weeks? It's all going to be zeros. Why don't we just hard code some zeros in? Nobody's going to know that there isn't any data behind it because the data isn't going to change for three weeks. Nobody's going to win any medals. And I think that's that mentality you should have on MVPs is just think of the leanest way possible because the audience aren't going to know. So it's one thing that I think we didn't get very well, well, didn't do very well at the Beeb, which I think we do really, really well at Sky, is working in feature teams. So at Sky, we work in a squads, tribes, chapters, and guilds model, um, an agile enterprise model, if you will. Um, so can I have to talk to you a little bit about this? If the tribe is, for example, let's say Sky Sports, each one of these things, is, each one of these cells are squads. And in a squad, you have a scrum master, a dedicated product owner, developers, testers, business analysts, everything that team needs to have to be autonomous. So one of these could be, let's say, the Sky Sports homepage, Sky Sports News, you know, however it's divided. Along the horizontal, you have chapters. So chapter leads, you appoint somebody who is a chapter lead of their discipline. So for example, of testers, you would have a chapter lead. Their job is to line manage the other people in their chapter, whilst most importantly still doing the work. So you don't have this sort of ivory tower manager who's kind of removed from the day-to-day -day work. They, they do the same job as you. They have added responsibility as a chapter lead. And they, you know, line manage, but they look at consistency. They look at best practices. It's a really cool thing. And then more importantly, that squiggly thing is the guild. So without the guild, the tribes could be quite siloed. You kind of obviously stick within your tribe. Um, the guild is kind of set up on themes. So anybody can set up a guild. Guild, we have a JavaScript guild, for example meets every fortnight, run by Richard McIntyre in Leeds, and anybody can go to it. They do a shout out, we do a JavaScript guild, anyone want to go? And that's that key thing of the guilds run to look at best practices, look at what's happening in the industry, are there any frameworks that we should be using? More importantly, are there any frameworks that we should start to look at deprecating that we shouldn't use? Is there any best practices, any books, any blogs, any training that we should be doing? And the guild, discusses that, and as a collective, they feed back to all of the tribes, and we take their actions on board. So, yeah, that's kind of the way we work in Leeds. So squads, tribes, chapters, and guilds, which sounds lots of Game of Thronesy. So I kind of start to fantasize that I'm Daenerys Targaryen in the office. I got told off for wearing that wig, and then, uh, unfortunately, without a dragon. Um, this is a cool one. So yeah, this is the other way we did work. We worked in a parallel tracks development. So I kind of constantly hear this sort of thing of UX can't fit in an agile framework. It's always UX holding us up. They haven't got the designs signed off or whatever. And I think the key thing is you've got to think about how UX come into the process that so they're always inherently in the process. It's not us and them, we're all one team. So the way we would do it is we would look at, we'd have a sprint pre-planning session and we would look at full sprint model or a five or a six sprint model. We'd look at the current sprint, 
And this would be a team of UX. We'd have you know, my, maybe my creative director, my technical lead, my head of business analysis, one of my lead testers, somebody from editorial, uh, somebody from delivery. And we would kind of sit there and we would talk about this. So we'd kind of go, look, what's in the current sprint? How's it going? Are we going to deliver everything? Is everything that we need to deliver still true? Really importantly, what, well, what did we deliver the last sprint? How's it testing? How is it being received? You know, is there anything we need to do on that? Do we need to look at putting more things into the backlog off the back of it? And then we start to look one to two, three sprints ahead. So kind of starting two sprints ahead, we kind of go, right, this work's coming in four to six weeks' time. We need to start to kick off the ideation on that. Who do we need to speak to about that requirement? Does that requirement still, is there a need for it? Those guys look at that. Then two weeks later, we look at the design work. So A, how much design work do we need to do? Do we need to do interaction designs? You know, can sort of high level, low UI features do it? And this is cyclical. So we're constantly always looking ahead. So UX have, well not just UX, but the teams that need to be involved have the due time to have the thinking room, if you want to call it that, to do their job properly. And this worked really, really successfully for us. Um, it might not for you, but I thought I'd share it. Okay. Name the music video. No. Shiny happy people. Hey, right. Your bag of sweets is there. You can have it. <laughs> Round of applause. Okay, so this is a kind of a key thing about morale. So when you're working on these big MVPs, a lot of the time you kind of can't talk about the fact you're doing them. And, you know, there is something amazing about when we're working in a proper agile environment and working on small features, getting them out to our users, seeing change and kind of feeling pretty great that you've implemented that change. When you're working on these sort of locked up MVPs, it is a bit kind of morale busting when you kind of can't get the work live very quickly. So beware of it becoming never ending um, is my kind of advice on this. So I kind of came up with a couple of suggestions around this. So I'm a bit of a geek for government digital service. I think what they do is absolutely awesome. And Mike Bracken, who is the chief, said this. Hire the very finest man, minds in digital and dress them in onesies. Have some fun whilst you're doing it. Insist on Hawaiian shirts, absolutely de rigueur. Make sure your insignia is good and have lots of cake. And make sure there's stickers. You can't beat a few stickers for your laptop. And this is some of the stickers that GDS guys have. And this kind of comes from, I think a couple of the guys from GDS, I think Russell was one of them. They went to NASA HQ in America and what's really cool is they have like a wall of successful missions. And what happens is when an astronaut has su uh, survived a mission, he gets to design a, a kind of a badge for NASA. And since they're astronauts and not designers, they're usually really tasteful. You know, something like an eagle in space with a Kalashnikov with a cigar in his mouth. You know, uh, you know brilliant stuff. Um, and so GDS kind of nicked that from NASA. And so they share, they share their accomplishments and they get their teams to design these stickers. So the, the kind of rules are that the stickers typically have to have an animal that in them and they have to have the GDS motto, which is trust users and delivery. And I, there's something I really love about this because it tells a story, it tells a person's journey within the company and all the amazing work that they've delivered there and it, you know, romantically looks a bit like a 1920s trunk, you know, but instead it's a shiny, nice Mac. But I really, really like the idea of it. But I guess, yeah, share your successes. Find any excuse to share and celebrate your achievements as a team. Ah, <sighs> Shandells. So, if in Waterfall, the testing is the thing that's squeezed in the Waterfall process, in Agile, it's the show and tell. It's the one thing that gets cold as a company. 
don't let that happen. You know, in my very, very humble opinion, I think it's probably arguably one of the most important things of the Agile methodology, because you're showing what you've done, you're showing code, you know, or you're showing designs, or showing thought processes, and you're telling people how you did it, and you're sharing with your peers your, your hard work. And going back to my point about the never-ending story, you know, they're the only people you can probably talk to about it, especially if you're an ND, under an NDA or what have you. It's really important for morale, and it's great to share your, your successes and possibly your failures with your team, and also as a team to learn from them. So don't cancel your show and tells. Trust. <laughs> so yeah, again, lessons learned on doing these big projects. You need to trust that taking the time to help others will not make you look unproductive. Make, yeah. You need to trust that you'll be treated with respect when you ask for help. You know, it's a key thing to get done in a team. Make sure you keep those values true. And if you're a manager, read that. <laughs> Always be honest about your achievements. Avoid the temptation to whitewash problems or misrepresent partially done work. And you do that by creating a no blame culture. It is so important. You know, when you're working to a fixed deadline, fixed requirements, you have to make sure that people are fess up if they've done something wrong because, you know, people make mistakes, we're human, but working in a place where you feel you're going to get bludgeoned at the back of the head a few times for doing it and it's going to constantly be brought up means people won't fess up and people hide problems. It's not a great culture, people feel shitty about it, so don't do it. At my last place, we had the baker cake culture. So if you made a mistake, if you broke the build, you know, you'd you kind of caused a bit of an outage. You know, we'd learn about it, we'd talk about it, we'd learn what went wrong, what steps we could put in place to correct it. And we would never speak of it again, but the person or the people who did it would have to bake a cake the next day. It was the next day. And none of this buying a cake from the shops and kind of duffing it in the packaging and trying to pass it off as your own. You had to bake a cake and we never mentioned it again. And I can assure you, I have eaten some truly horrific cakes in my time. <laughs> and I thought this was, stuff was pretty prudent as well. Because as we've talked about, Sky are hiring, hint, hint. Um, and, um, but I have a brand new team, and some of my team are here, and they're wonderful. And when you're forming as a new team, or when you have new people enter your team, I thought it was really good to talk about Tuckman's model. So Mr. Tuckman believed there are a couple of stages for a team forming. So he said, oh, bollocks. Uh, so he said, a team, I've spoiled it a little bit, bloody clicker. Um, so a team forms, right? So they form, you know, the girl's looking seductively at the guy. I think there's going to be some gossip there. Um, and they then they storm, and they storm for many, many reasons. Um, possibly, you know, uh, a love triangle. Um, but, um, but it could be down to communication. It could be down to introvert, extrovert. You know, it could be down to a lack of clear roles and responsibilities, too many people micromanaging, I mean, you name it, you can probably put your dots on that. And my advice on this stuff is really think about kind of doing clear races for the team. You know, what are you responsible for, accountable for, consulted, informed? Have, <laughs> have clear comms on, you know, kind of, what's happening within the team and um yeah it's you know you've got to kind of kind of nip that in the bud teams will storm and that's kind of natural as long as you kind of know that that's what they're doing and all you can do is kind of make sure that they're communicating and keep them in the loop around that and then Tuckman said they normalize they kind of get all of that sort of clashes out of the way and then they perform yeah um, 
And I guess the, the best way to describe this, if you guys like The Apprentice like I do, if you kind of think, yes, you know, they are genuinely a load of uh, <laughs> uh, interesting characters, um, but they kind of do that. They, they, you know, they form, they storm, they continue storming, but then kind of towards the latter weeks, they start normalizing. And then on that last challenge, when all the teams kind of get, you know, people back for the final two, they start performing because they know each other's strengths and weaknesses. They understand how each other likes to communicate. They kind of have kind of understood roles and responsibilities. It's a really good example. And I think my biggest tip is when you've got a strong team, when you're introducing new people into a team, have a think about where your team are with the Tuckman's model. So you work on all of this stuff, and then you finally get to launch it. You know, in my case, it's not a firecracker. It's not a grenade. It's like an atomic bomb of a change, and you have to expect some sort of backlash. So this is an interesting one. Customers tell you the truth, but not in the way you think. So I had the pleasure of working with Clive Grinkler a couple of years ago, and he formed Tangerine Design with Johnny Ive. And he told this analogy, which I thought was brilliant, of when he worked a long time ago at Philips. And they did this sort of session, a bit like you guys in the room. And they were, Philips were launching these boom boxes in the early 90s. And they had them in black at the bottom. And they had them in a load of different color variants. So one was in yellow, one was in acid green, and one was in acid purple. And they were kind of user testing, and they were testing the functions, the features, you know, all of that. But the main thing they were worried about was the colors. And so they were kind of asking people and just going, guys, guys, you know, what do you think of the colors? You know, do you, do you, would you have one in your room? And, and they were like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We definitely have the colored ones. You know, not the black one. No, no, the black one's so boring. It's rubbish. You know, we'll have the color ones. And so they were, you know, it's a complete mix of audience. And they, you know, they're going, you sure? And they were like, yeah, no, absolutely. The color one's absolutely amazing. And they were like, brilliant. So they were kind of, you know, patting themselves on the shoulders going, job well done. You know, we've nailed it with this color variant boom box. Um, and so they were like, right, thank you so much, guys, for kind of taking part in this user testing. Um, to say thank you, you get to take a boom box away with you. Um, guess which color all 100 people took away with them? Black. Yeah. They tell you the truth, but not in the way you think. Same with the theater. So here's a question. If you, who, uh, sorry, regular theater goer, how often do you think they go to the, to the theater? If a regular theater goer. Hello? Six times a year. Anyone else? Four times a year. OK. A regular theater goer, according to the State of the Play Theater UK survey this year, goes every three years. Every three years is a regular theater goer. Because it's perceptions, isn't it, right? Do you go to the theater regularly? Well, of course I do. I'm a, you know, because you want to, you know, think yourself possibly better or you want to associate with that. So you've got to really feel for theatre marketeers when they've got that sort of thing to work with. You know, with the BBC, we did loads of qual and quant testing. You saw on that thing, literally up to launch, every month or twice a month, we were going in front of users, testing features with them. And there's always going to be people who dislike change. So channeling my Buxton bug moment, here's some feedback. Arr, the yellow is too much. Seriously, we'll have to stop using the sight of all this yellow remains. Awful. It's so bad I haven't explored anything. Had to leave in such a hurry for the sake of my eyes. <laughs> I've just registered specifically to tell you how terrible the new website is. It's like something a teenager would have designed in 1998. Fuck you. <laughs> and curbside wrote on the curbside the redesign is like an explosion in a web design shop there's far too much happening on each page horrible <laughs> you know so the key thing is really you've got to listen there are things hands up that you know with everything I've ever worked on we've got wrong you know and that's hopefully why we work in an MVP way you know we work in the leanest way possible 
you know, and unfortunately we got things wrong, we learned from them, we listened and we iterated and we improved them. But there were things also that people were saying were missing. So for example, you know, we launched Sport without the video printer. We were talking about it just earlier. People were going nuts about that. And we had to kind of explain, it's an MVP. You know, we couldn't get everything done. If you want to wait another year, we can get everything as it was. You know, when we launched Refresh, a third of the site was done. So the highest traffic areas were refreshed to that nice yellow thing with the top navigation. If you went to something like a American football, you went back to the left hand nav, the old look site. And we had to, it wasn't great user experience, but it's an MVP. It was the leanest kind of cut of the site that we could do. Look at the data. Look at how people are using your site. Has it changed? You know, has usage gone up, gone down? Look at the cold, hard data. If you're A-B testing, that's good as well. But I guess the most important thing is people don't like change. And they don't like change because they like your product. And they like the way that they've got used to using your product. So sometimes you've just got to be brave and sit it out. And keep looking at these three areas, listening to what the audience is saying, looking at the data. But if you still think you're right, after you've looked at the other two, don't jump at the loudest noise. And last but not least, you've got to end on a cute picture. I'm not going to give any jelly beans for this, sorry. But you've gone through this amazing journey. You've kind of delivered this amazing thing. Don't forget to share how you've done it. You know, blog posts, if you can do it, share what you're doing along the way. You know, blog about what you're doing. Get people in your team, all of your team to do it. Make sure it's not just managers. Go to conferences, brown bag sessions internally and share what you're doing as well. You know, your GitHubs, your Behances and Dribbles. But my main thing on this one is make sure you do a wash up. It really bemuses me when you've delivered a big piece of work that you don't sit down as a collective and really discuss what went well, what didn't go well, what we can improve. And what can we change as a company or as a team to make sure that the things that went badly don't happen again? And how do we make sure that the things that went well are shared across the whole of the organization? And also importantly around the wash-up stuff is if you know that other people are working on a similar project, give them that data. It's nothing worse than having this really constructive and maybe at times cathartic wash-up and the learnings being trapped in a document that won't see the light of day again. And also, enter awards. You get to go to a lovely award ceremony. If you win, you get drunk and have fun. If you lose, you get drunker and have even more fun. Um, you know, Lucy's here in the crowd. Um, this is us with the four Webbies that we won for the Olympics, which was pretty cool. Um, you know, enter awards, you know, it takes time, but it's brilliant for the team and for morale. You know, encourage your team to go and speak. You know, Chris at Sky is doing an amazing job of getting public speaking training for our teams. These skills don't come naturally to people in our industry, or to be honest, to many people. You know, encourage it, because it's incredibly rewarding to people. And it also makes us, an, as an industry, stronger, because we learn from each other. And that is me done. Thank you.